Hello and welcome back to my Nutrient Nirvana channel. Today I'm extremely honoured to be joined once again by author and researcher Ralph Ellis, who has just released his new book, Shards of Illumination, Breaking Through the Deception. This new book is a compendium of Ralph's fascinating Facebook posts over the last five years. In Ralph's own words, academic disinformation appears to be reaching a peak. Was it always this way? And only now, with increased connectivity, can we see their duplicity? Or are we living in a new era of deception? The new age is not the Anthropocene, it is actually the Deceptocene. Thus we see clerics only telling their flocks half of the gospel story, medics refusing to investigate alternative therapeutics, climate scientists amending and cherry picking data, the media not investigating alternate facts and data, academics jumping on bandwagons for grant funding, and politicians using cherry-picked data to their advantage. Are these academic deceptions the result of intentional deceit or sheer incompetence? To be sure, there are any number of incompetent scientists, historians and clerics, but Ralph gets the impression that much of this is due to deliberate falsification and fraud. The world is awash with duplicity and deceit, and it is time to break through the deception. So, Mr. Ralph Ellis, welcome back to Nutrient Nirvana. How are you, sir? Very well, thanks. Uh, good to be with you again, Paul. Glad to hear it. Great. So, um, before we start, I'd just like to read a short quote by Eric Blair, a.k.a. George Orwell. Um, Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book rewritten. Every picture has been repainted, every statue and street building has been renamed, and every date has been altered. And the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. And I thought that was particularly pertinent for our uh, Q&A today. <laughs> So um, yeah, if you're ready to it's start, it's very Ralph, pertinent to our era, isn't it? Very pertinent. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So if you're ready to start, Ralph, let's dive in. I thought we'd start with the ancient world to begin with. So, uh, Ralph, can you tell us about the demise of the dinosaurs? Oh, well, that's going back a bit. Oh, I didn't think we'd go that that far back. Yes. Um, <laughs> Well, the demise of the dinosaurs. Well, I don't actually write about that. I, I write about the um, sustenance of the dinosaurs in some respects in my um, Ice Age paper, which is obviously regarding CO2 and whether CO2 is a um, <clears throat> primary or secondary uh, feedback agent uh, involved in warming. As you were saying in your introduction there, there is disinformation around, and most of that disinformation is coming from the mainstream media and the, the mainstream authorities who are giving us nothing but disinformation. And one of those bits of dis disinformation they're giving is that um, CO2 is evil. In fact, um, the EPA in America at one point tried to make CO2 a pollutant when actually, it's the most essential gas in, in the whole of the atmosphere. Without CO2, all life on Earth will die because CO2 is plant food. Without CO2, there is no plants. Uh, and, and without plants, there's no animals. So everything dies apart from fungi. Um, and in relation to the dinosaurs, I, I just mentioned in passing, that the huge size of the dinosaurs was mainly due to increased CO2. Because uh, remember that CO2 during the Cretaceous and Jurassic eras was about six times higher than it is now. So everybody is fretting about 400 parts per million. Well, it was much more than that back in the Cretaceous and Jurassic. It was more like 2,500 uh, parts per million. And it was that um, extra CO2, which allowed the dinosaurs to um, to thrive and evolve because it's plant food. Plant food, uh, extra CO2 gives bigger plants, which gives bigger herbivores, which gives bigger 
uh, carnivores. Uh, so the whole of the um, dinosaur era was based upon extra CO2. So no, CO2 is not a pollutant. Uh, that is dis disinformation. And that's coming from scientists and from politicians and from the media. And it's just typical of everything we're going to be talking about in this particular um, little discussion. Unless there's anything you want me to add to that? Yep. So um, basically, when we hear the phrase carbon zero, we should be very concerned. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I, they fixated upon a particular CO2 concentration, which we happen to have at this time. And they've assumed that that is the the optimum CO2 level that we should have within the atmosphere. But there's, there, there is no good reason to say that our present CO2 is, is the optimum. Um, CO2 is plant food. Uh, the increase from 280 parts per million, which was the, the um, pre-industrial uh, concentration of CO2, up to 400 parts per million, has greened the world. It is increasing agricultural production. There's a billion people on the on the planet at present that depend upon that extra CO2 mm. because it's increased agricultural production, um, especially in arid lands, because that's what CO2 does. It, it allows this tomato uh, to close up, to reduce, and so it reduces uh, transpiration, uh, water loss, and so plants can grow in more arid locations. So extra CO2 in the atmosphere is feeding a billion people at present. So anyone who wants to reduce CO2 uh, wants to kill a billion people. Well, we're constantly told, Ralph, that there's too many people in the world. So maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's what they want. <laughs> yes. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, well, so I, I, I did have that discussion with Greenpeace a, a while ago. This was about 10 years ago, and I had a discussion with Greenpeace. And they said that their um, converse to what you were saying in a way because i mean we do have to have a limit to the number of people on this planet we can't just keep uh, breeding like lemmings and jumping off cliffs um but greenpeace said that they have never and will never um campaign on population issues so the number one threat to the environment which is more and more human beings of course and all of the production and all of the consumption that we have they will not um, debate or campaign on population issues. So that came direct from Greenpeace. Okay. Okay. So on to our next subject. Um, Ralph, who was the green man? Oh, the green man. Um, green man is something that uh, appears in cathedrals and churches across Europe. I mean, he's, he's uh, pan-European in, in Catholic and Protestant. Um, and he's just, um, well, would you call him a gargoyle? Anyway, he's a, he's a face that appears uh, in various positions around cathedrals with foliage growing out of his mouth quite often and around him. So it's, it's this face peering out of of foliage um both in stone carvings and um what do they call them uh misery cords if you know your churches on the misery cords uh up where the choir sings and so on and the question is what is a green man why do we have this pagan looking green man sitting in all of our churches and cathedrals and the answer as far as i'm concerned is he's picking up on some of the ancient traditions within Christianity because Christianity goes back to Judaism, Judaism goes back to Egypt. And so all of these traditions sprang out of Egypt many thousands of years ago. And the famous green man from history is Osiris. 
the Egyptian god Osiris, the uh, husband of uh, Isis. And he was the green man. He's always painted as, as being green. And he is the god of, of death and rebirth, resurrection, uh, regeneration, plant growth, hence the plants coming out of the green man. And in Egypt, he was celebrated by the um, Osiris bed, they call them, which was a, a, a piece of stone or wood cut into the shape of Osiris and then sown with seeds into this uh, cutout so that the seeds would grow in the shape of Osiris because he was the god of um, uh, regeneration and new growth. Uh, much as his wife was uh, Isis was the um, uh, the goddess of Easter and therefore fertility and and uh, new growth as well. That was one of the central um, attributes and uh, qualities of the gods is they had to ensure the prosperity of the people, the growth of uh, new crops, the the um, uh, of rebirth of um, you know um, that was the most essential thing in in ancient times, and of course Isis and Osiris assisted on that matter. So uh, Isis was called Ast, and from Ast we get Easter. She was the um, uh, she was the Easter goddess. And her name, of course, was spelt with the um, Easter egg, which is where we get the Easter egg from. So it's all about renewal and rebirth. Um, that's what a lot of these ancient religions were about. Fascinating, Ralph. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next subject. I hope I'm going to pronounce this right. The Tule culture of uh, Gobekli Tepe. The, the, the Tule, yes. The Tule, yeah. Um, yeah, this is just um, an observation that the Gobekli Tepe and the um, tools of Sardinia, uh, Minorca and Majorca are very, very similar. So if, if you look at uh, Gobekli Tepe, which is at Odessa, which is interesting because that was the central uh, city that I say was to do with the uh, New Testament story, Gobekli Tepe is a very ancient temple. It's supposed to go back to 9000 BC, so pretty much the oldest temple uh, there is almost, I think, in the world. And the central uh, megaliths are T-pillars, so an upright with a crossbar on the top of a megalith, probably standing, I don't know, three stroke four meters high, so fairly large, in a T formation. And it just so happens that uh, on the Balearic Islands, uh, Minorca and Majorca, we have exactly the same formations. And over there, they are called tools, um, which I think is means a T shape. And they look exactly the same as the Gebekli Tepe T shapes. And the question is, is, is there a linkage between the two? Because there is a great deal of um, time between the two. So Gobekli Tepe is like 9,500 BC, whereas the uh, Minorcan tools are only supposed to be about 1,500 BC. So we're talking about 8,000 years difference between these two civilizations and these two um, temples or monuments with these megalithic T-shaped pillars in them. So is there a connection? We don't know. Are the uh, Sardinian, sorry, not Sardinian, the um, Balearic tools older than we think? It's very difficult to date stone. The only way we've managed to date them is by looking at the artifacts that's around these uh, temple complexes, which seems to indicate the Bronze Age. Whereas if you go back to Gobekli Tepe, there is no, in fact, there's not even any pottery, let alone any bronze. Um, we're pre-pottery uh, era, which is why they think it's 9,500 BC. 
So did the Saad, uh, did the uh, Balearic uh, civilization copy the Gobekli Tepe um, circles? The trouble with that is, is the Gobekli Tepe um, temples, which are these, you know, um, T-shaped monoliths in a circle, uh, were supposed to be covered up. So for whatever reason, they were covered up with stones and dirt. Uh, and that was supposed to have been done thousands of years ago. So from the traditional thinking of uh, the chronology, of these uh, temples, they shouldn't have been visible in the Bronze Age for the uh, Balearic uh, civilization to go and have a look at and then copy. So it's odd that this, this same formation of stones, T-shaped megaliths within a megalithic circle, seems to have lasted for so long at different ends of the Mediterranean. Uh, and they look rather, rather similar. So yeah, it's still a bit of a mystery. Thanks, Ralph. Fascinating. Um, I've been really looking forward to the next one. Uh, moving the Baalbek stones or the Baalbek stones. The Baalbek stones, uh, yes, uh, that's down in Lebanon uh, on my visit to the Lebanon. Um, the greatest of all of the temple complexes in the Roman Empire was Baalbek in Lebanon uh, because the Near East, Syria, Lebanon, um, at that time in the Roman era was the richest part of the Roman Empire. It only looks poor now because it's had a thousand years of Islamic control and Islam is not very good at producing wealth. And so it looks backward uh, and poverty stricken. But in the Roman era, Baalbek had the largest temple in the Roman Empire. And it's an interesting blend of megaliths and Roman megaliths. So at the bottom of the Baalbek temple, we have megaliths, which are the same as the megaliths underneath the uh, Jerusalem temple and underneath the Giza pyramids. It's the same megalithic architecture, these huge, great megalithic blocks that have just been put together fairly roughly in some respects um, to make a temple platform. And then the Romans, obviously at a later stage, the Romans have built a Roman temple on the top. But give the Romans their due, the temple that they built had some pretty large megaliths, not as big as the ones in the foundation, but they had some pretty large megaliths that they were using in the temple complex. So the pillars had a diameter of 2.5 meters, 2.4 meters. That's a big pillar. And okay, that the pillar was made of drums. It wasn't a single pillar. But nevertheless, each of these drums must have weighed 100 tons. I mean, they're quite substantial. They are huge. Uh, it must have been a very, very impressive uh, temple complex um, during the Roman era. Uh, but the interesting bit is the foundation stones underneath, which are megalithic and older and come from the megalithic era. And we have three good examples of those. I think, what are they called? They're, they have a special name. I can't remember what their name is, which you can see within the um, temple uh, platform itself. But if you go down to the quarry where they came from, which is about two kilometers down the road, uh, they have a couple, two or three, stones that are still left in the quarry that were never used. So they've been cut out from the uh, from the rock and they're still sitting on small plinths underneath them, uh, but they were never taken up to the temple complex. They were never used. And they are vast. So we're talking something, if I remember correctly, it's about five meters, uh, four meters by four meters by something like 22 meters long is the stone of the pregnant woman. 
uh, down in the quarry there. And there's a larger one down the road, which no one seems to visit, which is about five meters by five meters by 24 meters. So the first one weighs about, I think it's 1,200 tons. And the second one weighs about 1,400 tons as a single block to be used in the creation of the uh, temple platform. And the question is, why on earth would you want to do that? I mean, that's that's taking construction to an absurdity. It would be far simpler to cut the blocks up into smaller blocks and then cement them together, as the Romans did later, of course, when they um, uh, finished off the temple platform in a later era, than moving 1,000 ton blocks. I did a quick calculation to see whether it was possible to move uh, such a block. And if you get a decent, strong enough tree, something like a, you know, a, a decent redwood or, or a piece of oak, you could put it on rollers and roll it. It would just be uh, sufficiently strong that it wouldn't crush the rollers. But you would have to have a vast number of people to, to pull the stone and to maneuver it and it would be such an unwieldy and and totally um irrelevant no um absurd project to try and make a temple platform of stones of that nature i mean just what's the point you could cut these stones up in fact later on the second of the two stones the romans actually used it as a quarry and started quarrying uh, smaller blocks off it because it's just so much easier to use smaller blocks. And so the question remains as to why on earth you would want to use megaliths. And of course, this is not simply Baalbek. They were doing it in Giza. They were doing it in the temple platform in Jerusalem and many other locations around the world where they were using these vast great megaliths for no apparent reason, no good reason anyway. Uh, and why would they do so? Well, in, in my view, they would only do so if it was simple. You, you tend to use construction techniques that are within your capabilities, well within your capabilities. When Akhenaten um, wanted to build temples very quickly, he used the, um, what did he call them? Uh, Taliots, I think he called them which was a standard brick, which was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was two cubits by one cubit by one cubit. Oh, it's a fairly large block, but it's easily manageable by you know a team of people because he wanted to build these temples very quickly. And he used this standard size brick, which he put in his temples. Because that's simple, that's easy, that's logical. Using thousand ton blocks, uh, measuring five meters by five meters by 24 meters is not logical. So it tends to suggest that they had a technology that was rather in advance of what we give them credit for. Um, and this was not done because you needed a single block, like making a stella, a pillar or something of that nature, which you might say has has to be uh, a single block of stone. These didn't need to be a single block of stone. You could have cut them up very easily. So there is a great mystery in why we have this megalithic era with such vast stones that we never actually started moving until very recently. Um, I had a, a quick look at this for recent building technology. And the heaviest lift, I think, in recent, up until recent times, was in the 1980s, was the roof of a nuclear power station in Britain, where they did a 1,000 ton lift. And that was very unusual at that time. And they had to bring in four cranes, which were the largest cranes in the world, to actually lift it. That's how difficult it is to maneuver a thousand ton uh, single uh, stone, as it were. Um, cranes have increased in capability recently. So I think there are some single cranes that can now lift uh, a thousand tons, but not back in the 1980s. So it's only in very recent times that we've begun to start to 
move blocks the same as they were doing in Baalbek thousands of years ago. All very strange. Yeah, so there's there's various ideas on how they manoeuvred these uh, these blocks. Um, I've heard sound technology, levitation, uh, geopolymer, uh, concrete, all sorts of uh, different ideas. Is there any particular well, idea that you support at all? Uh, not really. They're not geopolymer. Uh, this is bedrock. You can see the strata it comes from. Same as with the Giza casing blocks that's not geopolymer you can see the um, quarry where they came from and you can see the strata from which they were taken um, so they're not geopolymer i don't know where that idea came from um, levitation well there is no proof i mean working within the bounds of normal science uh, there is no such thing as levitation unless there was a completely different technology which of of which we have no idea whatsoever same with with sound sound cannot lift uh blocks of that nature that's why we don't use sound in the modern era otherwise we'd be using it all the time if you know such a simple technique could be used to uh, lift blocks so you, you have to look into esoterica in some fashion that they had a technology of which we don't know about at present and that's difficult because it takes you outside um standard archaeology and standard history uh because they will not entertain something that is esoteric um but moving a block of that nature by hand it that strikes me as is not being possible um it's um and, and not reasonable. There is no good reason for doing it. Certainly the Romans didn't do that when they finished off. Because the interesting thing about the um, temple at Baalbek is you have this megalithic base underneath it. Uh, and then the top was obviously worn away or something because the Romans came along and they finished off uh, the top of the temple. So it looks like it almost had eroded away. And then the Romans built um, the top of the temple back on again as a Roman construction. And they used typical Roman technology with large blocks, but you know each block would only be five or 10 tons maximum. Uh, and then the temple itself had some rather larger blocks for making the um, pillars for the temple itself, which is quite a feat you know, for the Romans to lift a 100 ton block. Um, well, I, actually, I think they were more like 70 tons, but anyway, a 70 ton block. Um, to make the pillars of the Baalbek uh, temple. But do remember that the Romans had extra technology. They had, you know, block and tackle and capstans and things of that nature, which typically we say were not there during the megalithic era. So we're looking at a, um, a population who didn't have um, the technology of using a block and tackle to make the job easier and yet they were still moving thousand ton blocks. It's, it's difficult to explain. Mm. So we're looking at a lost technology, basically, aren't we? Well, yes, I mean, you can postulate that. But then, of course, it's a lost technology that we have no evidence for. That's the other mm. tricky thing is that um, any evidence for that technology has gone away and we don't know of it and we don't even have any images of it so they didn't actually draw um, any images of how they were lifting any of these blocks the only one we do have is the uh, dragging of a statue into position in Egypt where they were doing that with with sleds now that's a fairly large um, this is one of the statues at, uh, of Memnon, I think it's called, uh, which is a fairly large statue. So I don't know how much that would weigh. It would probably be in excess of 100 tons. So that was fairly large. Uh, and that was achieved by dragging it on sleds. But uh, that is a statue where you can imagine there's a good reason for making it of, of, of a single block, although the partner to it is, is made of uh, smaller blocks and then carved. Um, 
so yeah they could move some large stones but if you look at the size of the Baalbek stones it seems highly unlikely that they were moving stones of that nature I've actually um, interviewed somebody on my channel before and he lived very close to Baalbek uh, for a number of years and uh, when he came back to England he was under no doubt whatsoever that uh, it was built for giants that that's what he told me so i know that sounds very well, funny out there but the 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 tunnels underneath indicate it wasn't built for giants because the tunnels underneath are built for men so underneath the Baalbek temple there's a whole series of tunnels that go underneath it which were made they were constructed as tunnels uh from from day 1 when it was actually constructed and they're built for normal humans um so there's nothing terribly surprising about that but uh, it's just the technology they chose to make these temple platforms is bizarre to say the least if you go onto wiki and have a look at the Baalbek uh, stones on wiki um, you'll see a little character at the end of the stone um, with a black waistcoat that's me um, uh, I went there when it first opened up uh, when it because Lebanon had a civil war for ages and it wasn't very easy to get there. And so we had to wait for it to calm down a bit before we could go and see the stones. So I went out there um, and I took these photos of the stones, which was actually quite difficult because I was on my own at the time. So all I could do is set my camera on a 10 second uh, timer and then run like hell to the end of the stone and turn around and try and pose before the 10 seconds were up. So uh, it took about 14 goes before I managed to get those pictures. I don't suppose but anyway, the feature of that is there at all. <laughs> uh, no video, no, because I fell over several times. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting, but it gives you a, a sense of the size of the stones they were using. I mean, I really do look pretty small at the end of this stone, little ant sitting on the end of the stone. Okay, so moving on, I've managed to combine two of your posts into one here. So I've got an alternative view of the Sphinx's weathering and the Sphinx's wandering head. Yes. Um, yes, the... The weathering on the Sphinx enclosure uh, became quite a topic back in the 1990s because we have no way of dating the pyramids. Um, so it's always been a sore point that we don't know how old these pyramids are because, like many people, I don't associate them with uh, Pharaoh Khufu and Khafra. I think that's spurious. Um, these were temples. The, these were not tombs. No mummy has ever been found in, in a pyramid. Uh, and no pharaoh in their right mind would ever be buried in a chamber that didn't glorify their name <clears throat> and of course all of the chambers uh in the megalithic pyramids don't have any inscriptions they are completely bare and there's no chance in the world that any pharaoh will be buried in a chamber that didn't have his name inscribed everywhere and the book of the dead and everything else so they are not tombs they are temples and we don't know how old they are and so the weathering on the uh, sphinx enclosure became a, a hot topic because it appears to be weathered quite badly and that might indicate a an older date for the pyramids and the fact that it's leo and if you most of the things in in ancient history are to do with procession uh, if we're looking for the era of Leo, then the era of Leo, Leo is uh, 10,500 BC, a long time ago. So was that the reason why we have the Sphinx there? Because it was an imitation of Leo in the dawn sky in the vernal equinox, 10,500 BC. It sounds fairly logical to me. But the trouble is with the dating the uh, erosion on the Sphinx uh, enclosure is we have nothing really to compare it with. Okay, you can say it's highly weathered, but in comparison with what? So it's very difficult to give a date just from one piece of weathering. You need a bit of a comparison. And 
the comparison, I suppose you might say, is the Sphinx body itself, which has no water weathering on it, whereas the enclosure does. And that's highly weathered just from wind and temperature. There's no water erosion on the Sphinx body itself. And yet that is highly weathered. And considerably so when you look at other artifacts around. Um, for instance, the um, casing stones were taken off the pyramids, you know, just over a thousand years ago. Um, and those casing blocks aren't highly weathered in a thousand years. And they're probably of about the same constituency as, as the Sphinx body itself. They're not Tura limestone. They're not that, that hard uh, and durable. Uh, and then we have the strange case of, of the Sphinx's head, which is made of a completely different material. Now, it's made of a, uh, a strata that is above the strata that make up the body of the Sphinx. But the Sphinx is in a particular location. It's on the causeway, which comes out at 14 degrees from the base of the um, uh, second pyramid. And so it's in a specific location. So did they just happen to find this lump of this harder rock in the right place in order to make the head of the Sphinx? I rather think that's uh, unlikely. And so in which case they would have had to have dragged dragged this uh, piece of stone from its original position into the position they wanted in order to make the Sphinx's head. And that, again, is a very big piece of stone. We're probably talking about at least 2,000 tons uh, in order to get that in position uh, in order to make a head for the Sphinx. So again, we're looking at very high technology for the moving of these megalithic blocks. And the whole of the Giza Pyramid Plateau, is uh, much of that is artificial. If you look at the uh, second pyramid, they had to cut the second pyramid into the bedrock at the back end. But at the front end, uh, it was going to be in the middle of the air. And so they had to build up the temple platform in order to place the um, pyramid on top of it. And so they did all of that with megalithic blocks. Not quite as big as Baalbek, but they're still, you know, three, four, five hundred ton blocks in order to build up the uh, eastern side of, of the temple platform in order to build the second pyramid on top of it. It's artificial and you can see the blocks if you walk around the end of the pyramid. So that was a, a, a big discussion and contention we had back in the 90s. Uh, it still rumbles on today. My contention is it's much easier to look at the differential erosion at the base of the pyramid. So <clears throat> what we're looking for is a differential erosion because then we can get a much more accurate date. And the erosion I was looking at is the disappearance of the uh, casing blocks that used to make up the side of the pyramid. And they were the fine Tura limestone blocks, which were taken away during the Muslim era because they wanted to build uh, mosques in, in Cairo. And so they stripped the pyramids. And so we have a, a reasonably good sort of date for that. It's, you know, approximate uh, 1,000 years ago. And the thing is, when they took the casing blakes blocks off, the pavement block underneath the pyramid actually poked out from underneath the casing block. And so when they removed the casing block, it left a differential between uh, a pavement block that had always been exposed to wind and weather and feet of pilgrims and whatever, uh, and what had been protected by the casing blocks. And the casing blocks have now been taken away. And this is not two stones not two pavement stones, it's a single pavement stone that now has a line running down it from the era w which, uh, you know, w where it was always exposed and from an era when it was only exposed when the casing blocks were removed a thousand years ago or so. And so we have this differential and that differential is actually quite large. 
I made it at least 10 to 1 from the protected side to the always exposed side. And if you say that the casing block was taken away a, a thousand years ago, then, well, perhaps we're looking at an age for the pyramids uh, of about 10,000 years ago or so. So, and I think that's a much better way of dating the pyramids than looking at the um, Sphinx enclosure and, and not having anything to compare it with. And the other way I dated the pyramids was by looking at the the only pyramid that still has its casing blocks on, which is the Berent Pyramid down at uh, Dashur. And there's an odd thing with the Bent Pyramid in that someone has repaired it. So at some unknown point in the distant past, someone has covered the entire pyramid with scaffolding and chipped out all of the eroding pieces of block. I mean, we're not talking huge blocks here. We're talking only something that may be 30 centimeters by um, 15 centimeters or something and inserted a new piece of repair block. And so the whole of the face of this pyramid is riddled with repair blocks. They went across the whole surface of the pyramid and repaired it all. Quite a big job, actually. You imagine putting scaffolding up across one of these huge, great um, megalithic pyramids. And the question is, when was that done? It was obviously a long time since the pyramid was built. There would be no point repairing a pyramid in its first couple of thousand years or so uh, because it wouldn't have eroded. Uh, the casing blocks are very strong. They're, they're Tura limestone. They're very, very strong, um, very durable. So we're looking for an era in which a pharaoh was closely associated with the Bent Pyramid. And that pharaoh um, was um, Snefru or Snofru from the fourth dynasty. He is the pharaoh that people say uh, built that pyramid. But of course, th that's a bit odd because he's associated with three pyramids. Why would a pharaoh be associated with three pyramids? I don't believe one pharaoh could have built three pyramids. It's just not possible. But he was associated with three different pyramids, the um, Medum, the Bent, and the uh, Red Pyramid. But what if he was associated with those pyramids because he repaired them, not because he built them? Well, um, Snorfru, I'm just guessing now because I don't have the um, chronology in my hand, but we're talking something like 2400 BC here. Well, if he was responsible for repairing those pyramids, then we can at least double the amount of time uh, until the pyramid was actually built. Because if you look at the repair blocks, they haven't weathered that much. So those repair blocks can at least last something like 4,000 years without eroding too much. So the actual pyramid itself must have been built more than 4,000 years before that time. Maybe twice that amount maybe 8,000 years before. So again, we're looking at a construction date for the uh, Bent and uh, Red Pyramids as being something like 10, 12,000 years ago, which would equate with the uh, design of the Sphinx, which is imitating Leo, which is looking at the vernal equinox in 10,500 BC. So, the evidence, be it sort of circumstantial, the evidence seems to point at um, a construction date for the megalithic pyramids of being something like 10 stroke 12,000 years ago. Um, there was one fly in that ointment in that uh, uh, there was a character who 
invented this idea of the star shaft pointing theory for the um, shafts in the Great Pyramid. That is wrong. That is completely wrong. Um, inside the Great Pyramid, we have these four shafts, which nobody knows why they're there or what they do. Um, they were called air shafts, but of course the queen's shafts never went to the outside and they never even went into the queen's chamber. Um, so they were just shafts that were built and covered up and you had to go and search for them because they weren't obvious. And yet these shafts, uh, according to Gantenbrink, who, who did the first survey of these shafts, were the most difficult part of building the pyramid. He estimated that putting the shafts in doubled the time it took to build the pyramid because they're so difficult to actually put in there. Um, you have to engineer them so that you don't get longitudinal forces going down into the center of the pyramid because all the stones will just slip down straight into the king's chamber and into the queen's chamber. And so they have to have all of these different methods of trying to prevent slippage within the uh, shafts. It's very, very complex. So they're very important, but we don't know what they do. And so it was proposed that they were pointing at stars. Uh, not actually pointing because you can't look up them. So um, we're only talking over, about pointing uh, on paper, as it were, only as a diagram, and you can see them pointing at the stars. And that equated to about 2,400 uh, BC, which orthodox uh, archaeologists liked because it sort of equated to their era of Khafra and Khufu. And so they adopted it. And so you see this star shaft pointing theory uh, all over the place. But it's wrong because these um, shafts are pi shafts. So they're based on the um, uh, mathematical constant pi. The Great Pyramid is a pi pyramid. It's based on pi. It's based on 22 over 7 as being the um, uh, fractional approximation of pi. And the shafts are also based upon pi because the difference in angles between the shafts are 5.5 and 7, which is a quarter of pi. 5.5 over 7. Instead of 22 over 7, 5.5 over 7 is, is a quarter of pi. Um, and so it's quite obvious that they are mathematical, but you can't have a shaft which is both mathematical based on pi and pointing at a certain star in a particular era for the construction date of the pyramid. It doesn't work like that. Um, so the star shafts are pi shafts, nothing to do with pointing at stars. So you cannot date the pyramid from looking at the star shaft angles. Um, and that's quite important to understand. So the classical date of whatever it is, 2400 BC uh, for the Great Pyramid is um, wrong, unfortunately. And I think the uh, more likely date is something like uh, 10,000 BC. Quite old, in fact. And that would correlate with Graham Hancock's and Robert Bouval's dating of the pyramid, which is very interesting, I believe. Yes, but they had this <clears throat> strange conundrum in that they said, because of Leo, because of the Sphinx looking at Leo in 10,500 BC, that the Giza Plateau was designed in 10,500 BC, but they didn't construct the pyramid until 8,000 years later. Which just doesn't make sense at all. You know, they had a building project which spanned 8,000 years, uh, and they didn't build the pyramids until 8,000 years later because of this staff shaft, star pointing shaft theory, which gets in the way of the chronology of the Giza Plateau. So if you take that star shaft pointing theory out of it, then you have a consistent um, estimation for the age of the pyramids of 
10,500 BC, based on uh, procession with the Sphinx looking at Leo, based on uh, erosion at the bottom of the Great Pyramid with the differential erosion, and based on the repairs that have been done to the megalithic pyramid pyramids uh, down at uh, Midum, um, which all point to about the same sort of date, mm. 10,500 BC. So could the shafts point to the pyramids <clears throat> having a functional use? I don't know if you've ever come across Christopher Dunn and his idea about yes. the, uh, the power plant. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't um, go along with that because it's not. It's it's not built as a scientific type instrument. You only have to go in there and have a look. Uh, it, it's built as a um, megalithic temple, basically. You could not have. There is no room for there. There is no way you could put chemicals into the the shafts. Um, if you did, they would react with the limestone because it's just pure limestone. Um, and the shafts don't even link up with the outside or link up with the chambers. It, it, it just doesn't have anything to substantiate it whatsoever. If you want to look at an esoteric type uh, reason or rationale for making them, they are maps made in me megalithic stone. And the easiest way to look at this uh, is by looking at uh, Avebury, just down the road from Stonehenge. Mm. And if you look at Avebury, it's a big circle inclined about, oh, I don't know, about 23 degrees from due north with a road going across the axis and one going across the equator. Now, where do we see a big circle with an axis and equator leaning at 23 degrees? Um, mm -hmm. It's a picture of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to be esoteric about what these megalithic projects were all about, they were maps. Avebury is a picture of the Earth floating in space. That's why it has an axis inclined at 23 degrees to due north and uh, an, an equator that goes round the middle. It's an image of the Earth floating in space. Mm. And then you have to decide how uh, ancient Neolithic man knew what the, the Earth looked like in that era. But um, this is a consistent thing that has gone down through the ages. We still have the same uh, conundrum in a way with um, the... Hamat Tavera Zodiac in on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, which was a Jew Jewish, Nazarene Jewish Zodiac owned by Jesus, uh, Jesus of Gamala uh, and Sapphires. And that has Helios, the sun god, holding a spherical blue-green earth in his gravitational grasp. And that uh, zodiac dates from uh, about AD 60. So even in those early eras, people knew what the Earth looked like, and it, it was held in the gravitational grasp of Helios, the sun god. Um, and you'll see that on, on quite a few Roman coins as well. You'll see Helios holding a, a ball in, in his hand, uh, that the ball is, is the Earth. So there was ancient knowledge, and it doesn't just go back to Rome and to Greece and maybe to Babylon and to the Egyptians. It goes back to all of these megalithic projects where they had a good idea of cosmology and the form and shape of the Earth and the solar system and everything else. Um, we don't give them enough credit for what they actually um, knew and understood. Absolutely. Um, the symbol of God is H and the priestly H for Orion. Could you uh, talk us through that? Yeah. Um, there are still some secrets around. And one of those secrets is the um, capital H. So we have this mosaic from 
uh, Hukok, which is in uh, it, modern Israel, just down the road from Galilee, where we have a, an image of Bar Kamza, who was one of the kings of Edessa, uh, giving a sacrificial calf to the high priests of Jerusalem. And this would have been in AD 65, AD 66, just before the Jewish revolt. And the odd thing about this mosaic is the priests, the high priests uh, and the other priests from the Jerusalem temple have a big H on their tunics. And nobody knows what this H means <laughs> um, because there was no H in Aramaic or Hebrew. So it's not a, it's not a letter of the alphabet. It's not a number. Uh, it's not a known symbol. And so we don't really know what the H means. Um, but when looking at Gobekli Tepe, the same place we've spoken about before, up at Edessa, um, where the kings of Edessa had their uh, small principality, in Gobekli Tepe, although it was supposed to be covered up with earth and rock at the time, um, we also have a capital H being inscribed onto the um, T-tall, uh, megalithic T-shaped um, monuments. And it sort of looks very much the same as the Jerusalem priesthood uh, have on their tunics. And again, we have a problem because here we have a tradition from uh, 9,500 BC up at Gobekli Tepe, which would have to last all the way down to uh, the turn of the first millennium uh, for the high priests still to be using the same um, symbolism on their tunics. So we've got an, in, an immense chronology between the two. Uh, and the other problem is, what does it mean? You know, why, why do we have this H? Well, the H at Gobekli Tepe, I think, was probably referring to Orion. So at Gobekli Tepe, we have these circular temples, and I do think they are temples. Um, they're very much like Stonehenge, Avebury, uh, the Balearic Islands circles with their titles. And so you have this circle of stones, and inside you have two T-shaped uh, pillars, one of it which is inscribed with an H symbol, several H symbols. And it's quite possible that these temple complexes were zodiacs again. Again, rather similar to the Hamat Tavera zodiac and the Hukok zodiac, uh, which we had in Israel many years later. And they were looking towards Orion, who would appear on the horizon in the due south position, because due to precession, Orion was much lower uh, in the night sky than it is today. And it just appears, Orion just appears over the horizon, uh, I think in September, something like 9,500 BC. Um, and perhaps that's what the H symbol stands for, because if you look at Orion, it sort of be could, I mean, we consider it to be a person nowadays, you know, it's Hercules, uh, it's um, Orion, it's sometimes even Osiris. Um, but if you look at it, it also does look like an H symbol. So I was wondering if the H symbol at Gobekli Tepe refers to Orion. And so they were looking to Orion uh, appearing over the horizon in the September uh, of their era. But how that tradition would be maintained all the way through into uh, Judaism I'm not quite sure, um, but Orion has always been a, a very special part of, of the cosmos and of the zodiac. He was one of the um, one of the ringmasters of the cosmic zodiac. Uh, he was um, he was Gilgamesh, um, who was supposedly a king, but he was the the uh, Gilgamesh armed with his um, 
was it a club or an axe? Anyway, he was armed with an axe and a bow and he had to kill the bull of heaven. And of course, if you look in the heavens above, um, Orion is pointing his bow at Taurus, which is right next door, the bull of heaven. And then to, um, in order to attack the bull of heaven, Gilgamesh had to kill the Hambaba, the, uh, the six splendors of the Hambaba. And it's quite obvious that the Humbaba is the Pleiades, because if you look, because the, the, the Humbaba was guarding the neck of the bull of heaven. But in the night sky, of course, if you look at Taurus, the constellation that is guarding the neck of Taurus is the Pleiades, the seven sisters. Yes, yeah, the seven, seven splendors of the Humbaba. So it's quite obvious that the Gilgamesh story is talking about the procession of the equinox again. It's talking about the killing of the constellation of Taurus, the great month of Taurus, which brought in the great month of Aries. And so we know exactly when this story is, what, what it's talking about. It's talking about um, the change between Taurus and Aries in 1750 BC. So we can even date the um, Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, so yeah, this procession business and the cosmos and the zodiac, comes into all of these ancient religions. And it's quite useful because it allows us to do some dating, just like it allows us to do some dating uh, over in Giza as well. Okay, Ralph, let's end the first section on the ancient world with the sacred Stonehenge latitude. Yes. Um, we're back to megaliths again in the me megalithic era and the degree of knowledge that they had uh, in, in the design of these great ancient megaliths. And as we've seen, their knowledge is rather greater than we give them credit for. And there is another conundrum over at, well, we've seen a conundrum at Avebury. Uh, but there's another conundrum up at Stonehenge, which is just up the road from Avebury. Um, Avebury is a wonderful site, actually. I think it's better than um, Stonehenge because, uh, you know, you can go into the Stone Circle, which Stonehenge is now rather cut off. You, um, uh, you can't visit Stonehenge. You have to have special tickets in the morning if you want to go and see the stones. Um, but anyway, uh, when it was constructed, it was built in a certain location and it was designed with uh, an avenue, an orientation and an avenue that was pointing at the summer solstice, which is okay. I mean, anyone can do that. You can watch the sun during the summer uh, and, and watch until it comes to a halt as it travels northwards, as it does during the summer. And when it comes to a halt, you can stand someone out on the horizon with a big stick and say left a bit right a bit as the sun comes up at the uh, dawn and you can say right there and you have an exact angle to the rising sun at the um, summer solstice so that's not terribly difficult anyone can do that uh, and then you can build your temple around that avenue and that axis the odd thing at um, Stonehenge is that is a very specific angle. And um, off the top of my head, I think it's 52 degrees 11 minutes from due north is the angle of the rising sun at this the uh, summer solstice. But of course, Stonehenge itself is built upon the um, latitude of 52 degrees north 11 minutes. It has the same latitude as the uh, dawn angle of the sun. And that's the only place that that will occur. Uh, anywhere else on the earth, between the, uh, between the equator and the poles, you, it, Yes, I think I'm right in saying this because it's a, it's, you've got to remember it's a long time since I've written anything about these these topics. It's, it's 20 years since I've written anything about these topics. 
more than that, 25 years. Um, yeah, if I remember correctly, that only happens on one latitude of the Earth, where the sun angle at dawn equals the latitude itself. So it's not something you can replicate in France or Spain or anywhere else um, on the face of the planet. It'll only happen on that latitude. And that's the latitude that they chose to build Stonehenge, which rather suggests that the designers of Stonehenge knew the form and shape of the Earth, the size of the Earth, and therefore could equate it with the um, angle of the uh, sun at the um, summer solstice. That is quite a degree of knowledge, like we saw at Avebury, which is a picture of the Earth floating in space. Again, we have this um, very interesting degree of knowledge that they knew the form and shape of the Earth all that time ago, because we're talking about the megalithic era. Uh, we're talking pre-pottery, most probably, um, megalithic era from thousands of years ago. And now, of course, with our improved dating, we're probably talking 10,500 BC, not 2,500 BC. Um, so yeah, a very long time ago. And again, we have increased knowledge and increased um, technology than these people are given credit for at present. Okay, Ralph, I'm going to take a break for one minute. Do you need, do you need to stop or pause for a short moment? I'll yeah. fill up my uh, cup of water. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Okay, brilliant. Okay, then I, I won't be a moment. Yep, I'll see you in a minute or so. Yep, cheers.